Great, so good evening everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, uh, we are very excited to have you tonight here. Um, we are preparing a wonderful event with Peter Taylor. Um, and uh, before we actually get started, I wanted to welcome you, to thank you for your time and uh, do a small exercise where we are testing out where from you are connecting. So I'm going to launch a poll and um, you should be able to see it in your Zoom um, meeting. Please uh, write down. We might not have all the countries. Um, I try to, to cover as much as possible from previous events and um, the free text was not uh, an available option. So if you don't find yourself, um, we apologize for that. So we'll leave the poll running for one minute. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to share results. So we do have a very, a very interesting mix. Thank you for joining everyone. It's, uh, it's great to have you here. So let's get going. Um, this event is organized tonight by uh, PMI Switzerland chapter. Um, I would like to take a minute to emphasize some points um, with regards to, to PMI. Um, I am um, Stefania, I will be your host tonight. Um, I'm also representing the newly created uh, virtual events team for PMI Switzerland. And um, uh, we are excited to, to host you. Uh, the PMI Switzerland is actually uh, quite, uh, since quite some time uh, around, uh, was founded in 2001. So stay tuned for next year. We are going to have 20 years anniversary. So um, we, will, uh, we will be planning quite some exciting events. So keep, keep close to our, uh, to our distribution list to find out what, uh, uh, what we have for you. Um, the chapter actually has around 1,700 members uh, and approximately one, uh, 140 volunteers. Um, all of these volunteers, like myself, like Ravi, some other people who actually attend tonight, are offering um, to the whole project management community in Switzerland and also now abroad um, quite a number of events. Um, I would like to emphasize um, the social goods um, event, uh, which had in 2019 successful workshops with ETH, University of Zurich, and also for um, um, and also with the World Federation of United Nations Associations. Um, another um, um, item I would like to emphasize is our mentoring program. So if you want to mentor or if you are searching for um, for a mentor, please uh, reach out to us. Uh, this is a great program we are, we are offering and a, and a great service. Um, last year, so all, um, all these facts are actually based on 2019 data. Um, we uh, managed to organize 27 in-person events in 2019. Um, and this year, uh, due to the current situations with Corona, we all switched to virtual. Uh, so far, we had six virtual events and uh, we will be continuing uh, to offer this in our standard portfolio in order to ensure that our um, uh, events can be, can be reached by uh, colleagues who are also far away from the standard uh, in-person location. Um, we are also, we have a very strong presence on, the, on uh, various social media channels. So all of them, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, are all reachable from our um, from our site. So um, please, uh, if you want to to stay up to date with our events, um, follow us or like us or uh, uh, subscribe to our channel. 
Um, one important fact um, about the YouTube channel is that you can find our um, recordings from all the previous events we had. So if you are unable to stay tonight until the end, or if you would like to, um, to go back to a past event, you can always uh, um, check on our YouTube uh, channel all the previous recordings. However, all of this will not be possible without our uh, sponsors. So we'd like to, uh, to thank them for being um, behind us all the time. All the services we offer will actually not be, not be possible without them. And um, just to recap, um, for everyone who joined later, uh, we will be using the questions and answers to post your questions. So you can always, during the presentation, you can already, um, if something comes to your mind, please use the question and answer and uh, post your question. You can also use the chat if you like to interact with um, the other colleagues um, which are online. And um, we will also be recording this, um, this session. And um, just not to make you wait too much. I, I have the pleasure to introduce Peter. So Peter is the author of the number one best-selling project management book, uh, The Lazy Project Manager. Um, and he has delivered over 380 lectures around the world and in over 25 countries. His focus these days, after building and leading some of the biggest PMOs in the world, is coaching training and consultancy in organizations around the world who are transforming at an ever more challenging pace. He also loves challenging his actual, his actual profession. So he makes colleagues think about what they do and how they do it. Hence the topic of, of his latest book, Project Management is all bollocks, the complete exposure of the world of and the value of project management. So without further ado, I give you Peter, and um, I hope you'll have a fantastic event. Thank you very much. Okay. So let me just share my screen. There we go. That should be all there. Perfect. All right. Fantastic. Thank you for that introduction. And it's, I'm delighted to be back because you know, the, last, the last proper job I had was with PI Switzerland when I was out in Geneva at CERN, um, and, I, and I came into Zurich after that. Um, and then the world changed. So um, it, it's great to be back with the, uh, the Swiss team. And yes, tonight I'm going to be talking uh, project management. It's all bollocks. Uh, I, I can't lay claim to this totally myself. Uh, the lady that you can see on the screen there, we're enjoying a nice espresso martini. Uh, the lady is Susie Palmer True. And uh, she, she and I got, we kind of just, we met at a conference. We kind of got off uh, well together. We decided it was a, a great thing to do. Uh, we had similar sort of feelings about project management. And so we, we kind of began to challenge each other. And the result of that is, is this wonderful book. Uh, the cover is entirely Susie's uh, fault, having a bright pink book, but it's very different. It certainly stands out on the shelves. And I'm delighted to have the chance tonight to talk to you all about it and what I mean about it. Uh, sorry i'm just making a slide move forward there we go it's gone right we will this evening be using uh mentimeter so uh i, I gather most of you or quite a lot of you have used this beforehand so really all you have to do is you have to go into mentimeter.com uh, or menti.com rather um and you will see a code come up you enter that code and we can be all very interactive this evening, which is, which is a good thing. And I'm gonna start this with uh, this example here. Uh, I'm gonna put the code in as well, make sure it's working myself. Five, three, six, nine, eight, four. There we go. All right, so right now, just for a bit of fun, just to get things working, um, do you, are you in lockdown heaven or are you in lockdown hell? Are you working from home? Are you loving being back to work as the kind of new normal? I'm sure nothing is actually normal. Are you hating being back to work in the new normal? Are you kind of mixing it up between home and work? Are you back in the market or are you something, something else? Let's see what that says. I'm going to put my vote in there. All right. So yeah, quite a mixture. Um, nobody's doing something else, which is, which is good, I guess. Uh, most. Well, the majority are still working from home and you're working from home okay. Brilliant. 
I like that. Uh, so you've kind of got the hang of this remote working if you didn't know beforehand. Uh, I'm a bit worried about the 4%, 3%, 5% that are in lockdown hell. Are you just desperate to get out and get back to normal? Are you getting frustrated? Are you getting bored? Hmm, interesting. Uh, well, it's got up to 7% now. 3% uh, of you are hating being back to work as normal. Um, whereas 9% uh, of you are loving being back to work as normal. Oh, what else we got? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, there's the back in the market. I realize that's a, that's a big thing right now. Um, uh, you know, I'm running a number of sessions to try and uh, work with people who are back in the market, you know, some tips and techniques. Uh, so, you know, you can check, check me out on LinkedIn. If there's a session I'm running that's useful to you, then feel free to join up. Um, so just check that out or drop me a note. I mean, if we're not connected on LinkedIn, then send me an invitation right now. Um, why not? Let's get connected. Let's build the community. Let's keep the network going. Um, all right. Okay. I think that's good. Um, thank you for that. An interesting um, range there. I'm glad that most of you are reasonably positive there. You're kind of mixing it up between home and work. You're working from home okay, or you're in lockdown heaven. Uh, 49, 59, 60, nearly 70% of you are in that case. 10% uh, loving to work. Most of you are being positive. I appreciate that. So thank you. Um, what are we going to talk about tonight? We're going to talk about the book, um, Project Management. Uh, it's all bollocks. Um, I'm gonna, why do I think this? And what do I mean is where we're going to start. Um, then we're going to kind of ask you what you think. Again, this is part of it. It's, it's, these are very much my opinions, but really it's not just my opinions. It should be your opinions as well. You know, how can we, how can we, how can we best value and best promote project management? So please yeah, don't get the idea that any of this is negative to force project management. It's not. I am a huge supporter of project management. I believe in project management. If you don't know me, I've been in, well, you can tell, it's very old face. I've been in project management a long time. And for most of that career, I was in project management uh, specifically. Uh, the last 15 years, I have helped build some of the largest PMOs in the world. Uh, we're talking hundreds of project managers, thousands of projects, that kind of scale, uh, global organizations. And I, and I love doing that. And I, and I hope to be able to do that again sometime. I like to keep relevant but in the meantime and throughout the last 15 years yeah you know, thanks to the lazy project manager it's, it, to begin with and, and since then the all, all the other books i've written i've been able to work with organizations uh, events conferences congresses uh, private companies to do presentations keynotes um etc <clears throat> motivational sessions sessions and also some you know, well, training, workshop, masterclasses, coaching, the, the whole range is, is what I get involved in. It's, it's really mostly interested in what the opportunity is. Let's go from there. So if, again, if that's something that's, uh, that's of interest to you, you and your organization, let's chat. But I'd like to know what you think uh, about project management. And then I want to get onto seven cracking ideas to make your life better. This is really the heart of the, of the book itself. It's what do we think is the essence of project management? But this is where it started. This is, I'm sure you recognize, uh, and some people from Greece, they're bound to recognize this. This is obviously the, uh, the Acropolis. Um, <clears throat> this is where I met Susie, and, and I'd like to, if I may, you know, let's pretend this is a, let's, let's pretend this is some kind of book signing going on here or something. You've gathered, and I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read from the book for just a moment. It's not too long, <clears throat> but I do need glasses on to do that. So the, the, one of the last chapters in the book is what's called A Birth of a Legend, possibly. It was an explosive meeting of minds at an international project management conference in Athens, Greece in 2018, when two intellectual Goliaths came together by chance only to realize that their paths were always destined to align in order to bring about a new brighter future for their chosen profession. Bollocks, interrupted Susie. What, responded Peter. I was just getting into my flow then. Why did you stop me, he questioned. Well, that was all bollocks, wasn't it? Susie sighed in an exasperated way intellectual giants alignment of destiny explosive meetings and brighter future all bollocks totally and utterly so what was it then asked peter susie quietly sighed and then explained in a calm controlled tone we happened to be at the same conference you lied on stage about winning an award i called you out by subtly indicating i had actually won a real award and you generally sulked for the rest of the morning and most of the lunch if i remember correctly 
My memory is unclear on the actual details of timings, responded Peter, absolutely not sulky. But I know it was a point in time when we met and the outcome of this meeting is this very book, so something happened for sure. Well, now that isn't bollocks, agreed Susie. Good, we are agreed, Peter smiled. Yes, we are, agreed Susie. The earth moved. No, it didn't. We did meet, we did hit it off. We have a very similar sense of humor and a similar passion for project management. And we were worried about a number of aspects of project management at that time. It all seemed to get a little bit complicated. This is a quote from Richard Branson. Um, he said, never mind the bollocks. Do not let others define you. Keep working for what you believe in. Do not give up. Keep going. But the keep going was just getting more and more complicated, difficult. Right? The, you know, professions, when they, when they mature, there are more and more people involved and more and more stuff comes out. And some of it is useful and some of it is not useful. And, you know, we were worried from the point of view of someone entering project management tomorrow that they will be overwhelmed by this world, which is very strange because, well, it's more strange for me on the grounds that I entered project management completely accidentally many years ago. And as a result of that, I did what I did naturally, which was work with people, communicate with people. And then eventually, of course, I learned how to be a project manager and what that actually really meant. And eventually I went on a course and learned the mechanics of project management and became better at it, I hope. But the essence was there from day one. It was almost instinct. And we were really worried that people entering project management would be challenged by everything that is going on. And again, this is not, this is not a bashing of project managers, uh, project management leaders, uh, project management professionals, uh, any of the, you know, the associations out there uh, like PMI. It's not a challenge on the, on the body of knowledge or anything like that. These are all good things. But there is just so much out there that we felt, could we go back? Could we uncover what we felt is the essence of the book that isn't about process or isn't about the mechan mechanics of project management, but about the heart of project management. And that's what we tried to achieve with this book. Um, very much like The Lazy Project Manager, it's a very short book. It's very to the point and it's summarized in a very small chapter at the very end to make it easy to read and consume. And we were targeting it very much. We're targeting very much on new project managers, uh, project managers who wanted to, to revisit the basics of what project management meant. And also that growing community of people who were uh, delivering change as part of their day job. This is, these are the people I call the, you know, the projects as usual, usual or the informal project managers. These are people who are delivering change as part of their day job, but they're not necessarily called a project manager. Um, now, I guess most of you out there are formal, you know, full-time project managers. That's what you do. But you must recognize this in, in businesses, in your organizations. There are many people who are delivering change, uh, you know, just as part of their day job. And, and they don't necessarily have any, any background in project management or any training in project management or any skills in project management. And this is something, again, I've spent more and more time working on and developing, uh, you know, relevant training material you know project management for non-project managers in simple terms um informal project managers is is the kind of tag for the community i've got about so susie and i hit it off we talked briefly at the conference about you know wouldn't it be fun to write a book um susie is uh you know she, she was recently the the head of change for the open university uh she's just moved on to a new role now which is going to be announced very shortly um but She's a very, uh, she's a young, enthusiastic, uh, ambitious, challenging individual. And I found writing the book with her a very uh, cathartic for me in the fact that it kind of took me back to when I was writing The Lazy Project Manager all those years ago, that we were trying to produce something that just challenged the community and the profession. As I said, this is not, this is not project management bashing. This is, this is, this is challenging. This is like, what are the basics? So um, the book itself is broken up into these kind of three sections. The first part is, and we recognize this, when we wrote the book, we thought we just need to get some things off our chest. We need to just you know, de-stress about some things. So the first chapter is the bloody annoying world of project management and all the things we kind of get angry about. And we kind of thought, well, if we write about those things that make us angry, cross, you know, frustrated, 
put those to one side, then we can get on with the book. And the heart of the book is the seven cracking ideas, which I'm going to talk about in some detail on this session. And then at the end of it, we thought, well, there's more. There's a little bit more. Um, it's not about the heart of project management, but it is about the attitude of project management. And so the final part is, is called The Art of Getting Shit Done While Staying Cool. And yes, if you read the book, there are an awful lot of swear words in there. Uh, I will freely admit, Susie swears way more than I do. It's very impressive. Um, <clears throat> but we were excited that the, uh, the publishers allowed us to uh, produce the book as we wanted. So they they did, ask, did ask us to take a few of the swear words out. So be warned, it does come with a parental advisory, this book. Don't leave it around for your small, you know, your young would-be project managers to read. But it's, it's said in the, it's in the style of, and um, <clears throat> you know, imagine you're down the pub. Um, we're very excited the pubs are opening in England this weekend. But, you know, it's one of those things, you're in the bar with a friend, you're down the pub with a friend, you're, you're just having a good time, you're chilled out, <clears throat> and you're just talking about things. And, and actually, that's how the book was written. We did literally record conversations between us and then craft the, uh, the chapters from that. So as I said, the first part is all the stuff that just, just annoyed us about project management and the frustration. So what I'd like to do now, back to Menti, I would love to know what you know. Let's start with the positives. It's always good to do that. Tell me what, what it is you love about project management. Let's just talk about the things that you love about project management right now. What are the things that excite you about what you do on a day to day? Uh, what is it that drew you to the profession? What keeps you in the profession? Yet yeah, share with me um, these, these thoughts and ideas that you've got, you know, the things that you really care about. Working with people, connection with people, work with people, people. Look at that. The first three that came up are all about people making a difference, driving things forward and making things happen. Working with people again. Absolutely. Bringing value to the organization. That's cool. Um, yeah. Working collaboration. There's, there's just a lot. It is about the people, isn't it? People, people, whilst they challenge us, the pretty most difficult thing in projects, it pays phenomenally well. <laughs> Who is that person or where do you work? I'd, I'd like to come and work with you. Um, it pays, it's a good salary. It's a good salary, let's accept that. Um, doing new things, absolutely. Working with different people, yeah, having challenges. Uh, the fact there's no project similar to any other. Well, I think, you know, okay, they're all different. Yeah, they're all different. I see what you're saying there. Um, great team spirit, forming a team, leading success, being a superhero, excellent. If you've heard me speak beforehand, you know I talk about having the, uh, the project management uh, project manager's outfit, the uniform, yeah, be a superhero. Um, each day is different. Uh, working with people again, getting things done, connecting. I think these are all positive things. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Um, all right, let's move on to the, uh, the, the, the the counter question, if you like. What do you hate about project management? What, not necessarily hate, but what frustrates you about project management? <laughs> if we see people coming up as the first six things on the screen, then, uh, then we, that's going to be industry interesting. Uh, stakeholders, well, okay, you dehumanize the people. Politics, people, yeah, there it is. The hours, politics, stakeholders. Reduce the kickback from others, process, being accountable. <sighs> w, I don't know what W means, but it's makes, you make someone very angry, W. Um, we always used to do it that way. Oh, I see. Maybe that was the start of that sentence. I'm not sure. Too many performance indicators, bureaucracy, administrative tasks. Yeah. Top management. Yeah, rigidity. Yeah, we've had that one. Got that one again. Bureaucracy again. Admin work. It's politics. Politics. Seven billion tools to feed. <laughs> oh, dear. Excellent. Um, well, that's what, the, that's what you get the big bucks for. That's why you have all that money, is you can, so you can feed billions of tools. I agree. Tools are a real challenge right now. There are so many tools out there and, and so many non-connected tools for project managers. Um, I mean, the best I've ever got it down to in an organisation is down to three tools that project managers had to use, which uh, you know, is still probably what, you know, one too many, if not two too many. Um, organisational ob obstacles, going off scope, undervalued, misunderstood. That's an interesting one, isn't it? It's like the representation of us as a profession is, is questioned out there. Waiting for decisions, impossible deadlines, unrealistic expectations, indecision, yeah, and the same thing. Stop management again. People that don't buy into the process. Nothing yet, I'm, I'm familiar with. Okay, right, the actual process, I'm pretty green. That's all right, it's wonderful, don't worry about it. It's, it's the best job in the world, it'll be fantastic, don't worry. Uh, admin tasks again, resources, fighting, trying to inform senior management. 
negative thinking, politics. See that there's a lot, there's a lot that you hate about project management. And, it's, and some of the things in the book that we talk about is it's, uh, it's you know, why, why is a project manager always to blame? That's one that, that kind of gets me. You know, what do we even mean by project management to begin with? It's, it's, it's all those other things. Um, okay, some great stuff there. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, so, there were, yeah, there were a lot of things that we felt frustrated about. We, we got those out of the way. You know, there's, there's some, there's, they're like, they start off with conversations, and they really were conversations that Susie and I had, and then we wrote a chapter that followed on from it. And then once we'd done that, once we got that done, we felt, that's, we felt better, we felt refreshed, we felt energised, we felt we'd cleared the air. And then we focused on what is it we think is the essence of project management? What is it we think? And this, um, we came up with seven cracking ideas. We think these are the, the, the key elements to doing stuff. And so welcome to the cracking ideas. You know, this is, this is the heart of the book in, in you know, the next uh, 10, 15 minutes. So uh, hold on to your hats. Here we go. Surprise. Everything is a surprise. Everything is a surprise. Wow. Okay. Cracking idea number one. Everything is a surprise, which is interesting because when I started out in project management, the first thing I was taught was no surprises. The first thing I was taught was you should know everything. And the reality is I'm, we're arguing that actually there are surprises all the time. So our recommendation here is that based on the fact that pretty much everything coming at you will be a surprise. Now, sometimes they're very small surprises. It's, it's just like a piece of information that could be a surprise. Sometimes they're really big, like suddenly, uh, you know, you're no longer delivering this project to this group of people. You've got another 500 people to deliver it to, or it's got to be done six months quicker or something like that. They're, they're borderline shocks as opposed to surprises. But if you, if you have this attitude of the fact that you are used to surprises, it's a bit like being used to change then you know you're going to be in a much better place as you work through projects and the advice there is as it says your job is to work out what good looks like uh, some surprises will add value to what you do others will take you to or perhaps a very dark place so first thing is know how to differentiate between them quickly and accurately be decisive don't mess around focus on it think about it make a decision move on and learn, learn to be okay with the plan constantly changing and accept that help when it comes to planning as well. So, you know, you, don't be one of these project managers who create the, the, the plan of perfection and, uh, you know, that is it and that's it. Nothing will, nothing, nothing's allowed to change. Actually, you've got to let things change. It, you know, every plan as moment it's been completed is pretty much going to uh, change in some way, shape or form as the project progresses. And uh, optionally, and this is this is this is a, one of Susie's one. Start running into rooms and shouting surprise just to get your own back. It's the fact that you're you know you as a project manager, a project leader, is you're constantly being surprised by other people's expectations of you, uh, other people's uh, demands of you, um, uh, changes to scope, changes to timelines, changes to everything really. Then get your own back occasionally and shout surprise at other people and you know so, you know make them stop in their tracks. So. Yeah, the first idea we have, and obviously there's more behind all this, but you know, it's like everything is a surprise. If you think along this, like these lines, then you're going to be well prepared. When I worked in one organization, we had um, a group of people, we, we tried to do um, remote virtual project management um, for some of our smaller projects. And these things, they, they, it worked brilliantly. We, had, we, we recruited graduates. Um, we put them through an intensive training program and the idea was they'd spend a year or so doing remote project management and eventually they would then move up into um, you know normal project management you know project management face to face with uh, their stakeholders and their clients and the rest of it but the remote thing worked but it only ever worked when one of two things happened it only ever worked when there was no deviation from the standard plan. And the standard plan in this case was a workflow. Um, you know, we knew what we were doing with this piece of technology. We knew how it was typically implemented. There was a step. You asked the stakeholders to complete their step. Then you went on to step two and step three. Of oh, course, nice and simple. It was project management out of the box or out of the book. But the problem started when there were changes, when, you know, the client, the customer, the stakeholders, said no or did something completely differently then you had a problem then it was a matter of 
okay, I don't know what to do. So the other thing that came into play was you had to have experience. And when you had experience, then you could deal with it. So our, advice, that our starting point is that you know, just accept everything is a surprise, get help wherever you can, be ready for the fact that everything will change, and you're gonna feel a whole lot better. And the second thing is that failure is an option. Again, there's this belief that you, you have to be perfect, the belief that you have to deliver something uh, as, as, a, as a piece of excellence. Um, but the reality is, you know, it is, it is failure is just part of life and part of certainly part of project life. We're not talking about outright failure here. We're talking about coming to grips with fail fast, learn quick and do your best not to repeat the same mistake. You know, that's the, that's the healthy approach. You know, don't lock something in. Don't go into denial. Don't try and deal with everything uh, as, as a fact, you know, that uh, it has to be perfect. If you break it down to these bite-sized components of deliverables and tasks, and, and you know we're arguing big bang is your enemy in this case, um, then you kind of you know failure is is okay because failure again is little failure, little failure, little failure. Learn, 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 learn. Big success, big success. That's the idea. Um, and you need to have a sort of a place, something in place, a mechanism if you like that suits your style and that your that of your team to learn these lessons in a fast and furious and constructive way. So again, as far as, you know, the principles are exactly as it says there, fail, learn, succeed, repeat, simples. Fail, learn, succeed, repeat. That's it. But you have to instill that, that capability, that confidence, that approach, that style with your project team so that they, they deal with it in the right way and they don't panic and they don't, um, they don't get flustered, they don't get scared, and they, don't, uh, they don't go off the rails or anything like that. You've got to make sure that you demonstrate that this is acceptable to your team you've got to be open to learning quickly and redirecting the project and you've got to be ready to do that fail learn succeed repeat cracking idea number three is communicate it's all about communication versus engagement and there is a difference communication we can we've, you know you can talk about a lot but actually getting people engaged is a, is a different thing i could communicate to you over and over again but it you know I, it doesn't mean that you're engaged in what I'm saying. There is a difference. So the first thing is you've got to understand what it is you want to say and why, and whether you're, again, we're, we're brutally honest in this book, whether you're actually interested in a response. You know, sometimes, sometimes it's okay not to care. I mean, some, you know, you can't deal 100% of everything. So you can't totally care about every piece of communication that comes your way. And if you're honest, you're going to admit it as well. That, you know, you filter stuff. There are some things you just don't care about um, and it doesn't really matter. But you do have to understand your audience. You do have to understand the level of interest and you have to put the real effort into your supporters and those people who are not quite sure. And again, this is all part of, if you like, stakeholder and team management, understanding the people, understanding their, their levels of engagement with you. The problem is if you've got people who are not engaged, disengaged with you, you could spend an awful lot of time trying to win them over. And so we say here is that rather than flogging yourself uh, to death in an attempt to win over the haters, put your real effort into the people who support what's going on uh, and who are you know, pretty much on board and not quite so sure, so they can certainly be converted to supporters quite quickly. Speak the same language consistently and over time. Steady, steady regular communication is really important. Again, don't be, don't be afraid to ask for help from the right people. And you should remember that more often than not, you have to give something to get something. It's just that kind of world, isn't it? So you can't go around asking people all the time for stuff um, without giving something back. And that's something that's become incredibly clear in these current times, the amount um, of giving that's been going on uh, from myself and, and many, many other uh, project uh, people on the, you know, on the social world is is huge and, and taking advantage of that is, is amazing and you know we all do it with the hope that eventually something comes back our way number four is engage the winning so this is a classic uh, you know four uh, four box uh, four quadrant uh, boston matrix whatever you want to call it you know people are either uh, able or unable they're either willing or unwilling and then based on standard uh, approach you do a number of things you know, you can challenge people, you can coach people, you can counsel people, you can confront people. What we're saying here is that, you know what, benefit from the willing and the able. 
Uh, and then for the others, you go down to one of two paths. You know, it's a bit like, you know, communicate with the, the engaged and the supporters and all that. Benefit from the people who are really willing to help you and totally able to help for you. Work, work really hard with it because you're going to achieve a lot with just those people. For the others, you can either beg, plead, encourage them to join, join your formidable force of the willing and the able, or you can poach them if you want as well. It's all good stuff. Or you just move on. You let them be. You share your ideas in ways that are acceptable. You're clear on implications that they might experience if, you, uh, if they won't come on board. But then let them go. Nobody kind of leaves that level of grief. Again, it's all about priorities of your effort as a project manager. You can spend so much time trying to convert the unwilling, so much time to convince the, the disengaged that you stop doing the job you're supposed to be doing. Now, I get it. If there's some really critical resource in there, then you really have to make a decision and try and you know set a time limit of when you bring this person on board. If, and if it doesn't work, swap them out, challenge them, confront them, deal with them, go to your sponsor, whatever. But don't waste your time on people who are just not with you as far as this project is concerned. Cracking idea number five is there is no single point of failure. No single point of failure. Start with acceptance, there is this no single point of failure. Acknowledge that there are actual single points of failure all along the way. There are many, many potential points of failure. So, so consider these kind of start carefully at the start of the project and plan some mitigation, but don't create a perceived single point of failure by letting a whole bunch of small issues accumulate. So when you're looking at your project at the start, when you're looking forward uh, with your project, try and identify the little tiny breakpoints that you can see up there, the, the weaknesses in the link of the project chain and then do something about it this is effectively this is your this is your mitigation plan uh, this is your kind of you know your risk mitigation uh, issue plan and all of that but don't don't accept there is a single point of failure and secondly don't allow a cumulative single point of failure to happen because if you don't deal with that one small thing here then that links to another small thing over there that links to another small thing over there and eventually the whole thing breaks you don't want that you don't want that it's about anticipation and it's about small corrective actions all along the way. It's not like it's completely re-steering the project. You know, I've been in project recovery and it's a tough, tough job. It's a very stressful job. It doesn't always deliver anything of, of value out of the end of it either. Um, as you wrestle with these projects that are so off course that have reached that point of collected and cumulative uh, breakage or failure that it, you know, is it actually worth it is questionable. As you as a project manager should look at the small things and make sure they don't happen. And you don't need to be empowered. This is an interesting one. You hear about this all the time. I, you know, empowerment, empowerment for the people. I need to be empowered. I need the, you know, I need that freedom to be empowered. Well, okay. But rather than waiting for to be empowered or for someone to give you permission, why don't you just approach your projects in life by finding your place in the project's vision or objectives, seeking clarity until it feels right until it provides you with that anchor point, create space for reflection, creativity, and get, you know, get your hands dirty, do all of those things. But collectively, just take advantage. Just assume you are empowered. Now, again, there's always, there's always caveats there. There's always limitations. I mean, it doesn't mean you can go and sign off a, you know, a half a million euro extension to your project or anything like that. But for the most part in my life, I have, you know, I have, not sought permission but i have you know freely offered apologies when i've got it wrong or whatever um you know i've gone with the, the approach of well i'm going to do it and if i get you know if i get condemned for it i'll get challenged for it then i'll i'll own up so seek out these opportunities to make corrections and build a sense of professional identity and credibility and importantly stop waiting and start doing you know project manage project management project manager Project manager is a verb, it's not a noun, it's a verb. It's a doing, doing word we like to say in English. It's a doing word. So get on and do it, deliver value, enjoy your work, let, learn new things and be the best version of you. And it will bring about some very valuable and, and, and fantastic outcomes, I believe. And cracking idea number seven is all about the future, shaping the future. This is one of the most exciting sort of areas really of project management right now is what's gonna come next. Um, you know, we, we all know that the kind of 
digital transformation has accelerated. We know that the world is moving faster. We know we're going to we're going to be in in the land of uh, distributed, virtual, remote working, all the rest of it. Uh, teams everywhere, faster than ever before. And coming up is you know is is robotic process um, uh, accelerators. There's there's artificial intelligence. There's lots of things that's going to help in, in project management. But you know, for your for your own future, for the most part, it's in your gift to do it. You can shape project management. And the thing we, we, we say here is one of the ways you can really shape project management is to celebrate successes, celebrate those successes. And it doesn't mean the end of projects party or anything like that. It means that you can celebrate things regularly and constantly and throughout. It will, as it says there, you know, those celebrations will make the bad days that much easier. It'll make the shit days so much easier if you can actually celebrate. There's um, a story in the book that I, I tell. It's you know I have a thing called it's it's, it's known as the Starbucks moment, and there I right, start with there are other coffee suppliers out there, and and actually Starbucks isn't even my favourite one. You know, um, uh, in the UK there's a there's a different brand which I, I quite enjoy, which is Costa. But there are many many uh, coffee suppliers out there. There are many wonderful independent coffee suppliers out there. So I'm not recommending one over the other. But there is this, and I did laugh because uh, I talked about the number of, for some time now, I've talked about my Starbucks moment. And uh, I suddenly saw this. This is actually a gift card you can get from Starbucks, which is called my Starbucks moment. So brilliant. They've obviously caught on to what I've been talking about for the last couple of years. But it doesn't really matter what happened in this moment, but it happened in Starbucks. It was very influential on my life. It was a fantastic experience. It was a great celebratory moment. It was a joyous moment and you know and that's kind of where i started reflecting about that everybody needs a starbucks moment because i i if just talking about it, it makes me smile because i remember that absolute moment in fact i you know occasionally i go past that that same starbucks and i, and I can't help but smile and laugh and, and often force myself to go in and, and get a coffee just to relive the moment but the point about it is there was something there that i that i i found joyous and wonderful and valuable and I celebrated it and I continue to celebrate it and I tell people about it and what I say in, you know, in projects is it's the same thing for you and your project team you have got to celebrate uh, every opportunity um, because there are just there's got to be so many just like we said there were so many small break points in a project potential there are so many small joyous moments value moments successful moments this is uh, <laughs> This is a, a picture of an alligator, and um, this is in the Florida swamps. I went out on an airboat when I was out in Orlando last, and uh, we went out and uh, we went and found these alligators, which is very exciting, obviously, uh, very touristy. I know that, but you know, it's fun. Uh, and this guy who was uh, on the on the airboat, um, Captain Bob, um, he probably wasn't a captain. He probably wasn't called Bob, but he, you know, he referred to himself as Captain Bob. Uh, he, he he asked us, you know, what's the best way to escape an alligator and you know, the typical response is, well, people tell you that if you zigzag, the alligator won't catch up with you. Uh, that's the idea. And he said, Captain Bog said, that's a, that's the most ridiculous thing to do. What you need to do is trip up the person next to you so they fall over and the alligator will be busy with them so you can escape. Uh, and that's obviously, you know, Captain Bob's uh, regular joke with the tourists. And if you think about this in the, in the spirit of teams, you know, really in project teams, it's no one left behind. We don't abandon people like that. We don't trip them up and sacrifice them to the alligator and project success. What we should do is keep them on board with us. And one way of doing that, it really is, is to celebrate the great things that happen in projects. So I encourage you to do that on a regular basis. So we've had the bloody annoying world of project management. We've had the seven cracking ideas at, uh, you know, at a fast pace. The last chapter was all about the art of getting shit done while staying cool. And what I'd like to do now is see what you think what's the one thing you think we can do to make project management even better because you know the books come up with a few things i've shared a few things that we think are really important out there but what is it from your point of view do you think we could do to improve project management and i'm not saying as i said i keep saying this i'm not saying project management is bad project management is amazing some of the things that you see as a result of project management it around the world is just staggering some of the things that you see people have achieved or project teams have achieved is just absolutely amazing and you know it wouldn't happen without project management and project managers and project leaders and program managers and all the rest of it 
So please, you know, you know, come up and you tell me what you what you think as far as this is concerned. Because I think here that we have a great opportunity to continually challenge our profession, continually talk about things, uh, continually put forward ideas, and continually reassess what we do. Um, I'm not seeing anything coming up on the screen at the moment. I'm not sure why that is. Um, let me just go into my mentee and just see what I'm doing. Okay, I ain't gonna do that. So I've touched you something. Probably touch it pretty wrong. Okay. Um, here we have one of those wonderful little technical glitches. Um, the tool's great. All right, I, so maybe we can we can bring that into the the Q and A if you have something there. Um, it might well help here at that point. I'm going to try one thing. I'm just wondering if the question has got to be reset. Bear with me. I'm going to come out of this for a minute. Okay. Uh, reset results. This oh, slides. Just wondering if that is the problem there. All right. Let's see if this works now. If you could possibly give that another go. If not, I shall move on. It may not actually allow you to send it through if it's already gone through. But anyway, um, what I wanted to do was just kind of think, what do you think of it better? I mean, from my point of view, I think, as I said, there's technology coming our way. There's, there's opportunities coming our way. I think, um, you know, the, and I'm working with a number of companies around the world that are looking into the AI technology, that are looking into team performance technology, that are looking into robotic process. And I think there's a lot of things that we can do that will allow us to get back to focusing on what we really should be doing as project managers, which is actually um, improving things from a people point of view. Um, I'm going to move on. So uh, apologies for that. But the, the thing that is the fact that, you know, I think there are so many things that we could do that would incrementally improve things. And one of the best things that we could do is go back to basics educate people on the, the fundamentals of project management and not not i mean the mechanics are important i get that but also it's about the it's about the personal values it's about the intrinsic skills and soft skills that people have you know, it's, it's something you know there's a huge amount of the of the training that goes on uh, in the world of project management which is all about um the process of project management and stuff and I'm very you know, significantly left around the soft skills and yet it's about people. We saw that everything we loved about project management was the people side of things and delivery. Everything we hated about project management was the people, the stakeholders, the, the, the bureaucrats, the executives, the sponsors, etc. But we love the outcome. Another way of looking at it is, you know, to think about what kind of project manager you are. Now for me, the you know the greatest song ever written is um, radar love by golden earring uh, shows my age admittedly but i think it's one of the best pop songs ever produced you will no doubt argue with me you will no doubt say it's going to be completely different but if you think about a typical band there's there's a lead guitarist there's a drummer there's a bass there's a vocalist i mean the lead guitarist is is all about that excitement that that inspiration that goes on the drummer's there for the steady backbeat the fill in, the, the keeping thing going, the bass player is there to keep everything going together. It's, it's them, you know, the bass player is the, is the person who holds the band together. And the vocalist is all about the communication, it's about the showmanship, it's about the, the front end of the project, it's about being the, the centerpiece in many, in many, many bands. So um, let's see if this one works. This is the last sort of mentee I've got here. What kind of project rock star do you think you are? Now you could be the lead guitarist, the bass player, the drummer, the vocalist, keyboard adding extra uh, uh, you know, excitement in there are you the conductor are you actually coordinate everything are you the roadie the practical person who makes something happen are you the writer of the songs what's, what's the point in having a band if there are no songs um, are you a fan are you just someone who loves music great they're coming in now this is perfect thank you very much let's just see how that builds for a while Excellent. <clears throat> Nobody wants to be on keyboard, that's for sure. Okay. Because if you think about it, as, as a project manager, <clears throat> you 
it's interesting. This is this is this is fascinating. Uh, this is, so I've done this a few times. It's the first time. Yeah, typically, it's often the drummer comes out quite quite popular in these things because they see the people see that as a as a person who keeps things going, the steady rhythm of of the project. The bass player is not coming out number one on this one, which is fascinating as well because they do hold it together. As I said, the conductor again, quite often is is up the front there. Uh, lead guitarist. I mean, everybody wants to be the lead guitarist, don't they? It seems to be the most, uh, you know, the sexiest role, perhaps sometimes. The writer's fascinating. Impresario, a few, but not so many. Um, I think the point about it is the fact that if you think about it, you know, project managers, then we kind of need to be a little bit of everything at, at some point in time. You know, I would say, you know, we are we are the steady drum beat, we are the steady bass that keeps things going for a lot of the time. Occasionally our, our teams require us to be the conductor, to show them what to do. Sometimes they need the excitement. These are the kind of celebratory success moments. These are the periods where we talk about it. We, we have the fun, the lead guitarist is in there. Sometimes, you know, they want a little bit of a different tune and the writer's there. We definitely need to be hand, you know, getting our hands dirty occasionally to be, able to be the roadie. Uh, you know, don't be proud to get down and dirty occasionally, making sure you can always elevate yourself quickly um and so forth so i think yeah thank you for that that was that was always fascinating to see how people think about that my view is that you have to be you have to be a little bit of all of these at some point during your project so again don't be don't be locked into one thing which kind of brings us to the end of the presentational part we're going to move on to q a and just just minutes in one moment let me just wrap up with all my details, as you can see there, and I, you know, I have to thank Susie for helping me write this book. I wouldn't have written it without her. You can get all of my information there, lazyprojectmanager.com, uh, thepmtribe.com. Um, and at that point, uh, Savannah's back, excellent. Nice. There's the Q&A slide. What have we got? Absolutely, and actually before going to Q&A, uh, let, let's, come, let's shortly come back to the ideas you were asking the audience to bring how to make project management better. Oh, right, thank you. We've used the chat during uh, the technical glitch on Mentimeter to get the opinions of, um, uh, of the attendees on the chat. So I can um, start reading some. Uh, mm, great, thank you. So increase collaboration and transparency, remove silos. Be less rigid in the tools and allow more changes, more agile. Acceptance by the organization that failure is okay. Mm -hmm. Dedicated project rooms. Describe how to do KPIs in agile. Agility of admin process. Education, so more people understand the how, why, and the whole team functions better. Absolutely, I like that one, yep. Adapt to the battlefield as one of the, um, adapt to the battlefield. <laughs> okay. That's, that's a good tough, one. Tough project. <laughs> <laughs> uh, people management and mitigating political power plays within teams. Okay. Humanize it. Humanize it. Oh gosh, yeah. Humanize project management. Love it. Change and promote our and other mentality to be agile enough. Focus on value creation and communication instead of just satisfying bureaucracy, hierarchy, and lots of reports and documents. Adopt a simple model that everybody can understand and you can adapt to many situations from agile to very linear projects, different kinds of teams. Be out of the book, change mindset, accept trying things you didn't know about project management. Mm -hmm. Become better, change managers. Oh, that's an interesting one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let people outside of your field know about the existence of project management. Yeah, teach others. Force stakeholders to accept to put projects on hold if resources are not available. Hmm. Create okay. awareness of project management role to key project stakeholders and sponsors. Not all of them appear to understand our role. Oh, that's a that's a tricky one. Okay. Yeah. Promote always have a plan B mentality to be flexible as a team and the road. Yeah, yeah. Failure is an option. Keep going, change your path, but keep, keep moving forward. All right. Okay. So let me, let me talk to a couple of those, if I may. Um, so 
the kind of I mean the, edu the education and, and understanding what what project management is about I think it's really important and you know organizations really should keep the almost showcasing what's going on they should I you know I'm really when I've run PMOs I've always worked with other parts of the organization to explain to them what what project management is and some departments and groups know it you know marketing people they know what a project is because that's what they do but other parts don't really understand projects and also delivering sort of education for people who are, who, who deliver change as i said part of the organization but aren't project managers brilliant to showcase and, and show them some of the basics and you can imagine budding up a project manager with a non-project manager an informal project manager what a great partnership that would be to help the other person and i think the what was the other one there the uh, the humanizing it absolutely uh, and the value created creation i mean you know it comes down to the way you talk about project success that you don't just talk about we delivered on time to budget to scope you talk about the value that's been added to the organization you talk about the, the true consequences of the change that you've brought about and how that has happened and 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 i think the the social collaboration one we will uh, we will naturally move on to very shortly when we talk about something else i think that's a that's a great link into what we're going to talk about after the q a All right, then Peter, I would propose that we focus on some questions. Yep. Um, so I'll, uh, I have uh, some of them here. Um, one of them was actually from the chat. So can you describe how to do KPIs in Agile? <sighs> yes, <laughs> thank you. That's a nice one. That's a nice start. Just to break the ice. <laughs> nice, so easy one. One. <laughs> nice, easy one. Uh, look, I think it's where the KPIs sit. Is, is my my view on this organizations need kpis uh they need it to track what's going on with the organ with the business and etc it's where those kpis sit in the hierarchy you know and i think if if the projects are down here and the projects are healthy and agile is going on and changes are being brought about that then contribute to higher level kpis the problem happens i think is when when you try and drive kpis down at the lowest level because it's you know it's like anything the more you try and and I get it. It's it's um it's a it's a kind of a paradigm in the sense that, you know, there is this argument you can't manage what you don't measure. But the reality is, what you should be measuring is the appetite for an agile, productive, value creation, team performance, all the rest of it. If you measure that, then the outcomes from your projects will be great outcomes. So you're not measuring the actual in project activities at that level. That's that's my take on it. Uh, be fascinated if anybody else has a view on that on 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 the on the uh, the group out there. All right. So another question. Talking about celebrating every moment. What about failure? That is also a moment that could be celebrated in a way or another. Perhaps right after serving <clears throat> as a learning for a new success. Yeah. No. It is a. It is a. It's an opportunity for success, if you like. You know, you spin it a positive way. And this is the thing. You know, it's. You know, if you if you delay all of your if all of your reviews, all your lessons learned, all of your analysis, all of your retrospective to the very end of the project, then people are just tired. They they've worn out. They're already starting the next project. They probably don't care as much, etc. Whereas, again, if you've got those small small elements of failure, that you can go, okay, that was a problem. That didn't work. Why didn't it work? How can we improve things? How can we help other people to avoid it? All of that in the moment it is it is very small and and again this is kind of i think where some of the technology that's coming out right now will, will help us these kind of micro pulse uh project moments that can be uh recorded and then analyzed later on are, are really really powerful so yeah i think it's an opportunity for success uh, as well as a celebration of actual success are, are things you should think about mm. So now a quite different one. I work for an organization that has a very centralized and strong governance uh, project methodology. Mm -hmm. How can I challenge this and call out the bollocks I see every day? <laughs> Carefully, calmly, quietly. I, I mean, you can't, you can't directly call it out, you know. Um, you know, uh, you invite me in, I'll have a chat with them if you like at, at that level, we can have a, we can have a presentation and explain to the organization that they, they really should be having an open framework of opportunity, a structure for project managers to work to allowing you your creativity, etc. Reality is you can't do it in a big bang style. I think you can do it very gently, very small increments again, 
find something where you that you, you can demonstrate there is a success if you do it a slightly different way, a less centralized, less governed way. Um, and I think also, you know, if you can start to work in, in your, again, it's going to lead into what we'll talk about later. Again, start working in your team in a kind of social collaborative way. It will, you will start to see success, I'm sure, and you will start to be able to showcase the value of that success through your approach. And gradually, collectively, you, other project managers, your community can begin to demonstrate and to, ch and to collectively challenge the centralized approach to show that it's old fashioned and actually gay, you know, does have no, no advantage these days. Thanks a lot, Peter. But, but please don't, please don't go in with the book and put it down on, on the CEO's desk and go, that's all bollocks what you're doing. Don't do that, please. Don't do that. <laughs> that's definitely not recommended. Mm. Um, during your presentation, you mentioned your go-to three project management tools. What are they? I, I didn't mention what well, no, I said. I, I, <clears throat> I said the most I've, I've managed to do or the least I've managed to do is to reduce uh, the organizations I've worked in down to three tools. And typically in the world that I was in, it was a, it was a professional services automation tool, a financial tool and a project management scheduling tool with the three main things. I've worked with different ones, so I'm not going to actually name any any specific tool, but I've worked with the big ones that are out there. They all had advantages and disadvantages. Some were better than others, et cetera, in certain areas. But really the, the real challenge was freeing up your project managers to not be burdened by too much bureaucracy. But equally, you know, challenging some project managers, they do need to be at the center of their projects. They do need to take some ownership. They do need, you know, they can't put things off and not record things. So it's a balance between those two things. And um, so it's not, it's not my go-to uh, tools at all. You know, I, if I could find one tool that did it, or did everything that was needed, I'd go for one tool, absolutely, and minimize the repetition of input. That's the key. Thank you. So another question, talking about technology, you mentioned this will help project management. Could this also be a threat and how to embrace it? I don't think it is a threat. I, don't, I, don't, I really don't think it is a threat. I don't think you can automate what we do as project managers. Um, I think it will supplement. Uh, I think it will help. I, I mean, I, I, it's a, I suppose it's a slightly dangerous analogy, but it's like, you know, I could say at the moment, when I, you know, when I do get in my car and I do go to, to London, for example, you know, the first thing I will do when I get to London is turn my phone on. I will turn Waze on or Google Maps or something like that. Uh, I use Waze mostly these days. And it will, it will take the burden of navigation and traffic jams and roadworks away from me. Now, I know, you know, autonomous driving is coming our way and stuff like that. So maybe that's not the best analogy for the future. But I think you have to think of it like that. that it, they, these tools will come along and they will help supplement the project manager to do some stuff that actually most of us get bored by doing. We don't like it. And it will free us up to spend more time interacting at a personal level working with those people that we love and know actually make a difference. Mm -hmm. Another good one. In organizations that are highly regulated like pharma and where mm -hmm. a predictive cycle is more appropriate, how can a project manager encourage agile approach to be able to meet the rapidly changing business opportunities? Yeah, no, that's true. I mean, you know, there are certain things, <clears throat> there are certain um, industries that have a stronger need for that, that discipline and that, that governance. Um, but pretty much every one I've ever worked in, and I've never worked, I mean, the one industry I've never worked in is construction. So let's put that to one side. I've worked in pretty much every other industry at some point. And I've always worked in a, a, a sort of a hybrid way. And I think this is, this, is the, this is the key here that, you know, we used, you know, when we'd have methodologies that we always joked were, you know, strangely named, you know, they were gated, lean and agile all, all in one gate, all in one way. You know, they, but there were certain contractual gates that we had to go through. We leaned everything else, you know, reduced it and reduced it, but and, and supplemented that with agile everywhere we could. But if you looked at it, it was a waterfall approach in its structure when we explained it to people. So I think it's that, it's like try and find the small opportunities to, to go agile, find those opportunities to go lean um, and, and make the best of it in between, I think. But I think most, most organizations do actually use some form of hybrid uh, approach. 
Can a good manager manage anything or should he, she know about the industry or technology or the real work? So I presume it's just a project manager. Um, it's always, always an interesting one. And I, I just said just now, I've never worked in construction. I don't think I could manage a construction project. It just seems so alien to me. Um, I think it does depend. I, I mean, if you understand your industry, if you specialize in it and you're a project manager, then that's a huge advantage to you. You could equally, and I have been, I've been partnered up with someone who, who's like an industry expert uh, to deliver a project and that worked well. I knew enough about the industry to ask the right questions and challenge things. They knew enough about the industry to have all the detail and we worked in a great partnership and very successfully. Um, the principles of project management are the same wherever you go, the principles are the same, but it is the language, it is the understanding of the nuances of the industry, and it's about the regulations, regulations in some, some time. So, you know, it does, does often lend that like, you need someone by your side to help you. Thanks a lot for the answer. Um, how important is company culture for a new project manager in a company? Huge, I mean, think. <clears throat> One of the things you need to challenge is as a, whenever you join another, another company, it's the culture you need to understand and appreciate. You know, I've been fortunate enough to work in two companies where the culture is you know, totally the best I've ever had. I've worked in many other companies and they're good. But you know, recognizing what the culture is like is important to understanding. Can you, can you personally work in the, inside that organization? Because don't kid yourself, you can change the culture as an individual. You really can't. You know, they, you know, there's, there is that standard joke, the culture of its uh, strategy for breakfast, you know, it'll, it'll always overcome something. Um, and culture will consume you if, if you are against it. So if you, if for example, you know, if you've worked in a very free, open, cultured organization, or you know, perhaps a startup or something like that, and you go and join one of these heavy, centralized, govern, governed, controlled, maybe quasi-political, governmental organizations, it's going to be a shock. <laughs> You know, it's fundamentally different. It's one of the advantages of, of being, you know, a consultant for so many years is you get to see all these different worlds. So I think, you know, be prepared for the culture. Challenge yourself. Can you work inside that culture? Because you won't change it. Uh, not for a very long time. Uh, and make sure you're comfortable within that. Thanks a lot. So we do have questions coming in uh, quite a lot. So I'm going to... to pick from some of them, uh, just to take the challenging ones, not okay. easy for you. Mm -hmm. When you are- oh, yeah, pick, pick the hard ones, go on, <laughs> that's fine. Don't worry about me. <laughs> so when you are an external consultant, you are not allowed to make mistakes. The customers awaits for you, from you that you are good enough. I do not believe in openness for failure. If you fail, you fly out, point. Please give us concrete ex examples where you saw openness for failure. All right. So I think, and I, tell me if I'm getting this right. I think my experience is it, once you have a relationship with a, with a, with a, with a customer, with a, with a client, whatever, whoever is actually important in your project, once you have a relationship, they are as tolerant of anybody that's, that you're not going to get everything right. I think as long as you're honest with them and open with them, you don't store things up. Um, you know, I made a mistake in, in my early days when things were going wrong. I kept it quiet. I kept quiet. I thought, kept thinking I, I could turn it around. And eventually I had to go and talk to a, to a client and give them some really, really bad news. You know, we're talking projects being months late as opposed to we have a problem that might have an impact of a week or something or a cost. So I think, I think it is quite possible if you're very open and honest. I mean, they don't want to see you falling over and failing constantly and never responding or anything like that. That's a really bad thing. I think you know we're humans and we're, we're we're interacting with other humans and they know nobody is perfect as long as you're honest with them and I think that comes back down to I joke I said before I think you know there are surprises all the time well yeah okay but don't give your clients surprises if you can help it you know you know prepare them for the situation be honest be open and do everything you can to uh, to mitigate those those problems so um we do have uh remaining questions but in the interest of time i would propose that maybe we could address them um uh, offline if that's okay with uh with the audience uh we'll try to to pick the remaining uh, the remaining questions and uh, and come back to you in a in a follow-up just to be able to continue now with um sure with our program for today 
Oh, I'm happily answer them offline. That's a very good question. I think we have about like six left. Okay. Um, so that will take a, a, a bit too much time for, for tonight. Okay. All right. All right. So I okay. think we need to continue. Yeah, so this is quite interesting. So, so there was, you know, the, you know, social collaboration was raised as a as one of the things we could do to improve project management. Totally agree. And in fact, um, I'm going to have the delight of uh, announcing that on the 15th of September, um, I will be running a remote workshop for PMI Switzerland. Um, it's a three hour remote workshop. Their places are limited. You do need to book quickly, get a place on there. We're exploring social project management and what, I'm, what we mean by that. Um, you know, who should, who should attend? Well, what I'm saying is that what I'm aiming the workshop at is it's directed at anybody who leads projects, who leads community of project managers, or is just keen to understand and be prepared for this transformation to social project management. Um, and at the end of this workshop, what I'd aim is you, you'd understand and be able to describe this progression towards social project management or project management 2.0 is another term, but I prefer social project management understand the benefits of a decentralized and collaborative project world because i think these benefits are huge and appreciate what a project manager needs to understand about harnessing this social world and what i want to share through the workshop is you know roughly the outline of what we're talking about here but mostly around you know, what are the opportunities and what are the obstacles and how can you overcome the obstacles i really want to give you you know people attend this uh, a sort of value um, position as far as is concerned and it summarizes with a kind of top 10 list of things to do and to avoid when taking your project team social. You know, it's one of those situations you can't suddenly go, hey, tomorrow I'm social and we're gonna, everybody's gonna be social and it's gonna be great, we're gonna collaborate. It doesn't work that way, you have to progress. It's almost like a project in itself. So how can you go about that as a project manager? What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? What are the things to look out for? Um, and as I said, it's on, the, uh, it's on the 15th of September. Um, it's structured in a uh, best practice remote workshop format. Nothing is longer than 20 minutes and uh, everything's broken down and there will be breaks, etc. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. Um, increasingly, I'm doing these remote deliveries and they're, they're, they're pretty good. So I hope to see you on that. Um, Savani, I don't know if you've got anything to add to that or how people can book, uh, but that's it from me. Thanks a lot, Peter. So I'm going to take this over now. <clears throat> Thank you for for the inspiring talk. Um, it was uh, I myself. I was really looking forward to <laughs> to your to your presentation tonight to hear about the book because it, it raised interest, especially with such a challenging title. So thank you for uh, for taking time and um, um, uh, and actually um, explaining to us how the ideas came, what are the the main the main ideas um, uh, in your book. So okay. uh, moving on, um, saying thank you to Ravi and Stefan for helping me organize this event. Um, I hope everyone had a good event. Please bear with me for a couple of more minutes, uh, just to share some um, uh, administrative information. Um, don't miss um, our next virtual events. So if you want to meet the PMI board, um, we have a coffee talk on the 10th of July. And uh, the workshop Peter just mentioned, uh, social project management on 15th of September, or it will be three hours online, uh, managed by um, and organized by PMI Switzerland. Uh, it will be published tomorrow on our page. Um, when I'm going to send the um, follow-up email with the uh, with the recording and the slides from today, I'm going to include the link to the event as well. So if you want to learn about uh, social project management with Peter, please feel free to to register. They are is limited to 30 places, so it will be um, first came first served type of approach. Um, so before saying goodbye. Um, Many of us are PMI certified, so um, you can have here the PDU claim code for, uh, for tonight's uh, webinar. Um, I hope you learned something. I definitely did. Um, we um, would also like to hear from you. It's very important that uh, our events are actually meeting your, your needs in, in, in webinars or other type of events. So please take 
three minutes to give us um, uh, some feedback with the following um, uh, survey. You can use the link or you can uh, scan the um, QR code. Uh, the survey will also uh, open automatically when we close Zoom. So please don't close it immediately. Use three minutes to, um, uh, to give us some feedback. And most important, you will have there a possibility to propose topics for upcoming events. Um, so we are uh, willing to hear you uh, and organize um, webinars or keynotes or uh, panel talks on topics you think are interesting. So please don't, don't be shy, just share your ideas. Uh, we will definitely take them into, into consideration. So um, nothing else to say besides uh, thank you for your time. Have a happy summer vacation. Enjoy um, maybe a, hopefully a more quiet time at work now during the summertime. And um, we are looking forward to welcome you in some future online events. Have a great evening, everyone.